So, my name is James Haig, as Leon's just said. I worked for Pearson for the last 25 years. I used to be the chair of examiners for the IAL A-Level Accounting, and I'm the author of the IGCSE Accounting Book. So today we're looking at Module 2 of the Getting Ready to Teach program. So, today's agenda, we'll be going over the assessment overview, looking at a bit of the content of the IL accounting, what assessment objectives are and how they differ throughout, depending on the different types of questions. Students are answered. We'll have a look at mark schemes and help give you a better understanding. And then we'll finally run through some candidates responses and you'll have a chance at marking them. And I'll be able to give you feedback on what the chief examiner gave. And then we'll have a plenary at the end where we'll go through some of the support that is available and answer any questions. So the aims and objectives, as I've just said, assessment objectives, question types, mark schemes, practice using these mark schemes and then the support. So Pearson are the world's leading learning company as well as the UK's largest awarding organisation, best place to provide qualifications aligned to the British educational system. Our international heritage stretches back over 150 years and today we partner with schools, universities and employers worldwide offering world-class globally recognised qualifications to over 3.5 million students a year. We are a trusted and recognised qualification partner to 6,500 schools, colleges and employers globally. And we mark over 10 million exam scripts on behalf of the UK Department for Education each year, as well as operating in 30 countries. So, assessment overview, quick run through. I know we went through this yesterday, but some of them, some people were attending then. So, with two qualifications with one, we have the IAS, which is the International Advanced Subsidiary, which consists of one externally examined unit, so Unit 1. To get the full A level, the full International Advanced level in accounting, your students will need to sit Units 1 and Unit 2. So students must complete all assessments. So the IAS, the Advanced Subsidiary, is one exam. To get the full A level, students will need to sit both exams. So, Unit 1. The assessment is three hours long and worth 200 marks. The paper is split into two sections. Students must complete Section A, which is two compulsory 55 mark multi-part questions based on given data. And then Section B, students have a bit of a choice. They, have to, uh, they need to answer three questions from a choice of four. So three optional 30 mark multi-part questions from a choice of four. There'll be a resource booklet that accompanies the examination paper. Make sure your candidates are writing in black and make sure they are writing in the gaps in the papers because all the comp all the papers these days are scanned into a computer and marked that way. So just go over it again. The assessment is three hours long, 200 marks. Section A is two compulsory 55 mark multi-part questions section b the students get a choice but they have to do three from four of the options given to them unit two is exactly the same layout to make it easier on students pearsons have tried to simplify the exams to make them all very similar to each other so students don't have to think what am i doing in unit one and how does it differ in unit two so again the assessment is a three hour paper 200 marks, again split into two sections. Section A is two compulsory 55 mark multi-part questions based on given data. And then section B is three optional 30 mark multi-part questions from a choice of four. Again, there'll be an exam paper and a resource booklet. So to get the full A level, students will need to sit both unit one and unit two. To get the AS, they only need to sit unit one. Both papers are equally weighted and were 50% of the overall grade. To help centres with planning out their year, because some centres will be similar to the UK, where the school year runs from September to July, some centres run from January to December, you have three opportunities for your students to sit the exam. So there's the January series, the June series, and the October stroke November series. 
This will provide centres with a degree of uh, flexibility and allow you to meet the local conditions such as your academic year or your resets or your progression to high, uh, higher education. So assessment objectives. Specification describes the content, which is what we learned and went through yesterday. And the assessment objectives is what the candidate has to do in order to demonstrate their learning and achieve the grades in the exam. The content is specific to each unit. However, the assessment objectives span each unit through the number of marks allocated to each AO. However, it does differ slightly between the two papers, which I'll go on in a bit more in a little detail later. But AO3 and AO4 are slightly higher in paper two, as you would expect, because it's their second year of study. So we have four assessment objectives for the A-level. The AO1, demonstrate knowledge of accounting procedures and techniques and understanding of the principles and concepts upon which they are based. AO2, select and apply knowledge and understanding of accounting procedures, techniques, concepts and principles to a variety of accounting situations. Present accounting information in an appropriate format. AO3, analyse financial information, interpret financial data and information and communicate reasoning, sharing, understanding. And the final AO4, the hardest of them all, evaluate financial and non-financial evidence and make informed mechanisms and decisions. You can, you can see it's slightly a hierarchical approach. So you've got AO1, knowledge, AO2, select and apply, AO3, analyze, and AO4, evaluate. So they go up in ranking, starting off with the easier assessment objectives, just showing knowledge, then application, analysis, and evaluation. So here is the grid and how they are weighting. So in the first column, the percentage in IAS is what they need for unit one. And then for IA, AO2 is paper unit two, and then you have the totals together. So as you can see, AO1 is 30% for unit one, somewhere between 24 and 25% for AO2, giving you an overall 27 to 28 percentage for the full A level. In AO2, select and apply the knowledge, around about 43 to 44% for the for year unit one, 41 for 42, for AO2, and then for the full qualification, for unit two, sorry, and then the full qualification is 42 to 43. AO3, analyze financial information, 17% for uh, the unit one, between 23 and 24 for unit two, and that gives you an overall 20 to 21 for the IAL, for the full qualification. And then AO4, evaluate, 9 to 10 for IAS, or unit one, uh, 10 to 11 for unit two, giving you a, an overall 10% for the full A level. So as you can see, similar marks for AO2 and AO4, but the difference is AO3. So AO3 in paper two, there's a lot more analysis required from your students. So it's worth practicing that skill for paper two. So again, just a quick run through. So paper one, 30% for knowledge, AO2, 24 to 25% for knowledge, and then the full A level is 27 to 28%. Application, uh, select and apply knowledge and understanding of accounting procedures, techniques, concepts. Again, IAS, 43 to 44%. I, uh, unit 2, 41 to 42. And then AO1, 42 to 43 so what I want you to do is in the chat box, think, think about which layouts students don't like and then write down in the chat which which are the, the layouts, the big layouts of the accounts, so the financial position, statement of cash flows, thinking about those different layouts, which do you, which do you find the students find the most awkward? Okay, so if you just put those in the chat. Thank you. So which layouts or which standard formats do the students not like the most? Costing format, the theoretical part. Thank you. Keep the comments coming, please. So which parts do they find the hardest to apply their knowledge to? 
a few restatement of financial position. Statements of cash flow. Yeah, that's all my students don't like. They definitely don't like the statement of cash flow. I don't know if it's because it's brand new to them in unit two, but learning it based on the IAS format as well. There's very long titles in that one. That's quite an awkward one. Let's give you a few more moments if anyone wants to add the chat. That's the thing with these big statements. It is a lot of remembering. There's a lot of format that they have to get into, particularly high levels of knowledge and applying that knowledge in accounting where if they don't know the layouts, they don't really have much chance of getting a good grade. So it is a case of just practice, practice, and more practice. So thank you for that. So moving on, we have AO3. So again, as we mentioned, seven, only 17% in unit one, but a large jump to 23 to 24% in AO in pet unit two. So this is again where we need to talk about the chains of reasoning. I'll go into that a little bit more detail. So causes and effect for and against. And then when analyzing these questions, they need to have a developed chain of reasoning and a continuous prose when it comes to their asset writing. It is very difficult to achieve the higher grades of analysis and evaluation if students are bullet pointing. All right, we need to move away from bullet pointing and get the students to write in continuous sentences, continuous prose. And then the final A04, the importance of decision making. So this will involve reviewing information and then bring it together to form a conclusion, drawing on evidence, including strengths, weaknesses, alternative actions, relevant data or information, and then a supported judgment or decision will be reached in relation to the context. So again, around about the 10% for both papers, just a slightly higher in unit two. So, both units will require students to answer an evaluative question. So, section A, the evaluative questions will be for 12 marks. And in section B, the evaluative questions will be for six marks. These questions will be assessed using a levels of response grid. These questions, uh, these criteria used reflects the assessment objective. So, again, we need continuous prose, not bullet points. The colours for each O are reflected on the next slide of what they need to do. So we're going to be looking at how the AOs are shared between the 12 mark questions and the six mark questions. So for the 12 mark questions, level one, students is awarded one to three, level two, four to six marks, level three, seven to nine marks, and level four, 10 to 12 marks. So this is what we talk about levels. It's having an understanding of what level that student's work is at, and then starting on a grade from there. So level one, there'll be isolated elements of knowledge and understanding on re a recall basis, weak or no relevant application to the scenario set, and generic assertions may be present. So level one, it's very generic, not really applying the knowledge to the case study, just a very, very basic answer. Level two, there'll be some elements of knowledge and understanding which are applied to the scenario. A chain of reasoning are present, but may be incomplete or invalid, and a gen generic or superficial assessment is present, so that's level two. Level three, students will need to be accurate and thorough understanding, supported through the relevant application to the scenario. Some analytical perspectives are present, which develop chains of reasoning, sharing causes and or effects. An attempt at an assessment is presented using financial and non-financial information in an appropriate format and communicates reasoned explanations. So again, it's that focus on a developed chain of reasoning, uh, thorough understanding and knowledge throughout, relevant application to the scenario, and then some attempt at an evaluation or an assessment at the end. And then level four, accurate and thorough knowledge and understanding, uh, supported through relevant and effective application to the scenario, 
a coherent and logical chain of reasoning showing causes and effect. Assessment is balanced, wide ranging and well contextualized using financial and non-financial information. So when we get to the marking exercise, you'll see that we think about a level first and we tend to start in the middle. So for example, if we let, think it's level two, we will look at it awarding five marks and then if we think it's a good level two, we'll move it up to six. If we think it's a poor or a weak level two, we would move it down to four marks. So that's the process that we go through when we're marking. We think of a level first, put it in the middle of that level. So for example, it's level two, we'll start at five marks and then either work up or work down, depending on how strong we see that level two. So. Moving on to the six marker, again, similar, only three levels on this one. So you've got level one worth one to two marks, level two, three to four marks, level three, five to six marks. So again, so the purple, the isolated knowledge and understanding, gen, gen, uh, generic assertions may be present and then weak or no relevant application. So for level one, we're looking at very basic knowledge and very weak application. For level two, there'll be good elements of knowledge which are applied to the scenario. Some analysis is present with developed chains of reasoning showing causes and effects, and an attempt at evaluation is presented using financial and perhaps non-financial information. And then for level three, accurate and foreign knowledge and understanding, application to the scenario is relevant, coherent and logical chain of reasoning, is present and then evaluation is balanced and an uh, appropriate decision is made. So, as I've said, we are we work on a positive marking situation. As an examiner, I'm slightly more positive than I am when I'm marking my own work with my own students working class because I expect I'm far harsher on my own students than I am when I'm marking. So it's to reward accurate, relevant and valid responses. Marks must not be deducted for incorrect statements. So there is no negative marking as an examiner. Students are penalised by wasting time writing an incorrect answer. So we don't penalise them twice. So marks must not be deducted for incorrect statements. Marks are awarded for what is written, not what is implied. Again, quite a difficult one, particularly when you're reading something and you want them just to continue it a little bit more, but we do not assume that's what they were going to write. The answers may not fit neatly into each level for the different assessment objectives, and therefore answers are therefore marked holistically across all four assessment objectives. Examiners will determine the level of response and then an award appropriate mark within that level. So that's the things you've got to think about when you're marking. Always try to be positive. No deductions for incorrect statements. Students are already penalised by losing time. Marks are rewarded for only what is written, not is what is implied. And sometimes uh, an essay will go through all the different four assessment objectives. So it's having an overall holistic approach. So under, understanding mark schemes, hopefully for accounting, they are fairly straightforward. Remember, a mark scheme does not show all correct answers, just those that the students are most likely to come up with. So mark schemes are written at the same time as the exam paper is written, but then they can be changed or altered during the marking system, depending what answers students come up with. OK, so they're not set in stone when the paper is written. They can be adjusted during the marking process. So the purpose of the mark scheme, to show the correct solutions to questions set in an examination paper, to show how marks are rewarded for each part question, to show how the assessment objectives are covered in the question paper, to provide consistency between markers, and to provide consistency from one exam to another. So, in your delegate packs, in the packs on the side of the screen that you can access, 
please can you open paper one unit one and mark scheme paper one unit one and we'll go through some of the questions in there so i'll give you a couple of minutes just to open those up Okay, if we look at the very first question and have the mark scheme open at the same page if possible. So we're looking at 1A.1. So if you look at the question, it is worth four marks. So hopefully you've had to give you a bit more time to open the paper one and the mark scheme for paper one. So hopefully on the mark scheme, you can see it's got AO1, two marks, AO2, two marks, and then a little bit of an explanation. So two marks for balances and introducing capital, two marks for the goodwill ca calculation and posting. And that's what the assessment objectives that are being tested and perhaps how the marks are allocated. So... Just another quick explanation of it. So one mark for goodwill entries. That was uh, given AO2 because it's a bit more application in there. One mark for the capital introduced. That was classed as a knowledge mark. One mark at AO2 for the goodwill entries again. So again, that's looking at application. And then one mark for the, all the balances brought down. Lots of students do not balance the account off at the end and bring it down to the start of the next month. They are losing important marks for doing that. OK, so it's very important students do balance off and get the accounts ready for the next month because they, they are losing marks. And that is one of the big things. Don't know if it's just they're being lazy in the exam or they've just forgotten that. But please ensure your students balance brought down ready for the start of the next period. So when it comes to the mark scheme, mark allocation one or two appears next to the correct figure in the answer together with the relevant AO in red. If you see the figure OF or the letter, sorry, OF or OFR, this refers to the own figure rule. The principle with own figure marks is that the candidate should only be penalised once for an error. So if they subsequently use a correct figure correctly, incorrectly, then mark this for a order. So a good example of this is in the statement of comprehensive income. For example, you've got the revenue at the top. The calculate the students have to calculate the purchases figure. They've calculated that incorrectly, so they lose the mark for the purchases, but they've correctly used that figure to get gross profit. So gross profit would be an own figure rule because they've managed to do revenue, take away purchases correctly with everything else in there to get gross profit, but they would lose the mark for purchases. So it's one of those things, particularly with numerical answers, you are only penalised once. So if they got the purchases figure wrong, that might just be they've written it down wrong from copying off the thing. They would lose that mark, but they could get own figure for the gross profit. So own figure is very important. It's one of those to tell your students just to keep going. They may think they've got the purchases figure wrong or any figure wrong in one of these long statements, but they will only lose one mark for that as long as everything else is correct after that one so for example the profit share calculation is based on the candidate's own figure if it is correctly uh, apportioned it is awarded the mark however if they got that wrong but then balanced everything else off it correctly they would still get the mark so it's worth pointing out this for your students that just because they've got say one figure wrong doesn't mean they can't get still the rest of the questions right. It's a bit of a pain when you're examining it because you've got to get your calculator and check it all. But we need that there. 
And it's also very clear that students need to show and highlight their workings more, particularly on the big numerical questions, get them into the habit of working one, say, for example, for purchases, show that and then write that next to it. There's a lots of good techniques students can get by picking up. Then we look at the non-evaluative written words. The command words are comment, define, explain, and state. So mark schemes will reflect the command word and the value of the marks available. So for example, state four advantages for ABRA of preparing full accounting records. That is four marks because it's state. This will be classed as knowledge base, so only A01. With four marks, a brief statement is all that is required. No development is needed to gain the mark. So it's as simple as it says, it is just state. So for example, the mark scheme will say, valid answers may include, remember that is not a full list. That is just what the comments of the most common answers have been throughout the assessment series or what is expected by the examiners. So as this is a state command word assessing knowledge, no requirement to extend or develop essays. We do get students who like to go off on a tangent and write masses, half a page on this. All it is is it's state. So if it's a state one, you can get to away to some extent with bullet pointing. So each statement is worth a single mark only. Okay, other valid answers may be available and centers should not restrict their teaching to mark scheme solutions. If we go on to explain, then we need a different approach to state. All right, so we need a bit more of a sentence. In the mark scheme, we'll see a very, very basic answer. So explain the difference between an error of compensation and an error of reversal. So error of compensation, more than one error, which cancel each other out. That is the basic we would expect for an answer. And then error of reversal, a single error where the debiting and crediting are reversed. Here the mark scheme shows a basic statement plus the development for the two marks. All right. Remember, we're not expecting the answer to be the same as the mark scheme. I don't think there's many students who would write it as simple as that. But you need to make sure your students understand the difference between the command words. And that will help save them time in the exam. So state, very, very simple. Explain, you need that development. All right, so state can just be one line. Explain, you need to have the development. It's knowledge with a development side to it. Then move on to the longer mark questions where you will either have the command words of evaluate and recommend. So these are the ones that we looked at earlier for the six and the 12 markers. The mark scheme will provide a range of possible valid answers. So for example, the question, evaluate the use of accounting concepts and conventions in the preparation of the financial statements of a business. Positive points for concepts and conventions. So enables the financial statements of different businesses to be prepared using the same approach. Enables different periods and businesses to be compared. Trust on the reliability of the information by stakeholders. Negative points for concepts and conventions requires professional input to apply these concepts. Concepts and conventions can contradict each other and interpretation of the concepts and conventions can vary. So there you've got your nice for and against and then your decision. Candidates may conclude concepts are critical for accounting or not critical. However, they should support that decision with appropriate rationale. So as you can see, it shows the possible arguments that can be put forward. Again, it's not an exhaustive list, but merely indicative of the type of responses that can be made. Candidates who merely copy the mark scheme will not achieve the higher level. All right, remember which answers should be in continuous prose and lead to a further development of the scenario. So this is when you're marking, you need to think, is it continuous prose? Are they relevant points and have they developed them fully? Okay, so it's not a case of learning the mark scheme when it comes to these types of questions. So 
quick reminder of a 12 marker. So you've got four levels. Again, when we mark it, we think what level it is looking at those descriptors. We decide that because we've got the nice, easy, the three marks for, for level two, so four, five, six, we start at, if we think it's level two, we start at five marks, either keep it at five or work up if we think it's a good level two, or if, for example, it might have some elements of level three in there, or we move it down to level two, grade four, or mark four marks if we think it's not a good level two. So assessing students' work. So what we're going to go through is some exam questions. So again, you'll need a copy of the exam paper and you'll need a copy of the mark scheme. So just a reminder, the mark scheme is, shows the correct solution to the questions. It shows how the marks are awarded for each part of the question. And it shows how the assessment objectives are covered in the question. It's helped to provide consistency between markers and consistency to one exam series and the next. So what we have is a small range of student answers for questions from the above range. So hopefully you can find the mark scheme for that. So it's question 2A. It's a nice, easy uh, question to some extent. It's prepare the trial balance as of the 31st 30th of April, sorry, 2019, including the calculations of the capital. The mark scheme should show how the marks are awarded. So there's 10 marks overall. There's eight marks for A01 for simple knowledge, correctly putting the, uh, the numbers on the debit or credit side correctly. And then there's two marks for calculating the capital using the balance in totals. So what I want you to do is have a go at marking that exercise. And then once you've done, put your marks in the chat, please. So have a look at question two, how many marks? Give you a few minutes to look at that. And then put your answers in the chat. So overall, it's worth 10 marks, 8 marks for AO1, 2 marks for AO2. Remember, no negative marking. Thank you. Got the first mark since. If you see the word CF, it means we're after the correct figure only. A okay, couple of marks in, just give you a few more minutes. I know some of you are finding it difficult to find out where the resources are, so I'll just give you a bit more time. But so far, we've got a five, a five, and a six.
Okay, answers are coming in. Let's give you a couple more minutes. Okay, I think that's most of the answers in. So it was awarded five marks. So five marks for the five correct entries. There was no mark for the capital as it is on the wrong side and it is correct figure only. Candidates did not score the final own figure mark as the total figures were 12,600 and 14,550. So they are not the same. So they are the incorrect question. Uh, marks so five marks for that was i think most of you are in the right ballpark which is good so the next one same exercise Doing for eight, nine, nine, seven, and seven. A few more moments. Okay, so script two oops, was awarded eight marks. So they lost marks for the bad debt being on the wrong side, being on the credit side rather than the debit side, and the capital figure had to be correct. So this own is correct figure for capital. They did get the own figure for balancing it off correctly at 12960 on both the debit and the credit side but they lost marks for the bad debt being on the credit side and lost marks for the incorrect capital figure. So, good. So, moving on. We're going to look at the mark scheme for 2B this time, so the trade receivables control account. State two possible reasons why Mel has a credit balance on her account. So it's A01. Two marks for identifying 
possible reasons for a balance. So it could be return of goods after payment, a contra from the trade payable account, pay for goods in advance, paid twice or overpaid, error in recording. Okay, so on the next page, you're going to see three answers. So when you cut the marks, I'm looking for three different marks. I'll put an example up on the thing. So what we need. So there's going to be three answers. You need to give marks for all three of them. So marks seem to be trade receivables to say two possible reasons why Mel has a credit balance. Those are some of the possible answers. Remember, they're not an exhaustive list. They're just the possible answers that they could have. So, I'll just put it up for you. There you go. So, I have a go. And so, there's three answers. So, think of a mark for the first one, the second one, and the third one. Thank you, Maria. Remember, it's a state question, so they don't have to write a lot. Give me a few more minutes. Thank you for the answers coming in. Okay, thank you. So the first answer, a mission error transaction was missed out, not to be entered, or part two, maybe a wrong amount was entered. This was given one mark for the notion of error in recording, both related to errors, so only one mark was awarded. So I think nearly every one of you got that right. So for the first one, it was worth one mark. 
The second answer scored zero. It is neither a precise reason for a credit balance or, in fact, relevant. They've just seen reasons for doing it and gone, basically, I don't know really what they're saying, but that was awarded no marks. And then the final answer, it scored the full two marks. It was short, precise reasons were given. Again, just be careful on the terminology. We shouldn't be using debtors anymore. It should be trade receivables. So please be aware that candidates are expected to use the correct IAS terminology and may lose marks for that in future exams. So if you're not sure of the terminology include, uh, you should be using, it's all the new IAS terminal, terminology and it's in Appendix 6 of the specification. So please make sure that is what you are using. So it needs to be all the new terminology. So moving on to 2C. So this is a mark scheme for 12 marks for calculating the balances and populating the control account. So as you can see, we've got the dates, we've got the details, we've got the correct numbers, hopefully. So note that only the only figure not awarded in the mark scheme is the DR balance CD60. So there's one mark own figure rule at the bottom which is for the 1st of May balance BD 3050. So that's what they should have on the credit side for the balance CD 3050. Open and closing needs to be calculated from the information given. But that's the, like I said, it's the only one that is own figure. The ledger it needs to be in the correct file format. So often fail to respect this. So valid dates, reasonable narratives in the details and especially on the balance BDs and balance CDs. So hopefully you found that mark scheme in your pack. So I'm just gonna have a look at a couple of these. So you've got 1st of April balance BD 2650, one mark. 1st of April balance BD on the credit side, 91 mark. 30th of April, credit sales 5,000, fit and then returns inwards. So it's just one mark for each answer. So it's quite a nice, easy, tick box exercise and then there's the own figure rule on the 1st of May balance BD. Okay let's have a look at one. So script one question two. Use my squeaky chest. Again, remember there's only one mark for own figure rules. The rest have to be accurate. Thank you for the mark so far. Okay, got a bit of a disagreement. I think some of you are being a little bit generous. So, 
With this one, there's lots of missed opportunities. There's no balance BD or C on both sides. They've got the balance CD at the end, but remember it, they need to be the correct figures. They've not balanced BD it ready for the start of the next month, and there's no dates. So it's pretty is this is quite a poor effort. However, it is not uncommon. We do see students struggle on the trade receivables control accounts. So this was awarded oops, one mark. It was only given one mark for the interest. All the rest were um, uh, wrong. So reasonable narratives would be expected as per the mark scheme rather than those of the individual debtors. The candidate has failed to calculate the opening and closing balances from the information given. And again, they missed the opportunity of gaining the closing balance own figure rule by not balancing the account correctly using their own figure of 2990. So not a good example. Student only got one out of 12. Okay. So let's have a look at another one of these. So same again. Okay, thank you for the marks coming in. Give me a couple more minutes. Okay, thank you. So this was awarded eight marks. So the four balances are correctly calculated for the information given. Interest charged is on the wrong side and they've missed three entries out. So the irrecoverable debt returns inwards, discounts allowed. This highlights the need to look at all the information given in the question and the candidate is probably not to refer to these entries in the trial balance previously calculated. The narratives are reasonable. If this was marking my own student, they wouldn't have got any marks because they didn't put the dates, but that's because I'm harsh. Remember, we need to be using the new IAS terminology, irrecoverable debts, not bad debts. And the narratives, they've got the balance BD, so it was quite nice that way. So eight marks were awarded for that. So hopefully that makes things a little bit clearer. So now we're going to move on to the 12 mark questions. So... 
Question is, evaluate the use of control accounts. So 12 marks. Remember, we're not looking for a perfect answer because students are under time conditions and under stress. What we need to think about is what level this, this is at. So you need the mark grid for question 2E, and you need to come up with a level first. So is it level zero, level one, level two, level three, or level four? Look at those key criteria. So is it basic knowledge? Is it good knowledge? Is it good applic uh, application in there? Is a strong analysis and evaluation? And then come up with what you think. So I want to know what level you think it is and what mark you would give it. Oops, sorry about that. What level you would give it and what mark? Marks were, uh, thank you for that comment, Liz. Remarks were given because the dates were deemed, the marks should were given because they were being generous. To me, my opinion is the, the marks shouldn't have been given for not having the dates. I would expect the dates to be there. Okay, so yes, dates should be required for A level. So I think now, now this was an older paper when we looked at the control account. I think nowadays they are being a lot harsher and it's one mark for the date, the details and the number. So please advise that your students do put dates in their control accounts. So having to read through this, what level do you think it is? I mean, if you look at the newer mark schemes, you will see that it's date, details, and number for the mark. I think it's very it's very strict on the newer ones, the last couple of series. Okay, so you're thinking about what level and what mark you would give it. So is it a level one, a level two, a level three, level four, and then what mark? Okay, thank you. Let's give you a few more.
going to be a few more. Some people are still writing. Okay, so this is an example of a level two response. It demonstrates more than a basic knowledge and understanding, but the answer has not been developed sufficiently. sufficiently. The first sentence is very generic and not credit worthy. The candidate recognizes that control accounts can assist in locating errors, but the points, points are not developed. They also recognize that not all errors would be revealed by the use of control accounts. So this was agreed as a level two, but was awarded four marks. So elements of knowledge with some chain of reasoning. So if you're in the three, four, five region, you're doing well. Okay, so it was level two. Four marks. Like I said, it was deemed that was just a little bit more than basic knowledge and understanding, but not fully developed. So, same exercise on the other on script two. Again, these are not common from what students will write. And again, show them your students. There's plenty of examples on the website that can help you but show them the links. So again, think about the level and think about the mark. Thank you, Maria. Thank you. Let's give you a few more moments to add your marks, please. So, looking through this one, see... So Candidates made it fairly obvious that they've got positives at the top and negatives at the bottom. This was deemed to just sneak into level three. So it contains accurate and good understanding. Several points were made, but they are not fully developed with a chain of reasoning. There is a lack of assessment of the use of control. So the response is limited. So it just sneaked into level three with seven marks. I myself, when I mark this, I did give it level two, six marks. So if you're in the six, seven mark boundary, which I think a lot of you are, 
don't worry too much. Again, show this to your students. Show them, ask them how they could improve it. What would make it better? All right, there's some good points there. It just lacks development and lacks an assessment or an evaluation at the end. If they'd have developed them a little bit more and put an evaluation in, then that would have been a lot higher marks. So again, it's good to show your students that this is what they can, what these are what marks are being awarded and use it as a way of teaching that. Like I said, there's more examples on the website. And then the final mark for today. So it's script three. Okay. Have a look at this one. So again, it's still not common to see students bullet point and they do miss out. Thank you, Maria. This is a nice one to show your students because it could have been a lot better if they'd have gone with a fuller chain of reasoning, a full of development and not bullet pointed their answers. So this response was given level two, which I know will cause a lot of controversy for those that saw it in level one, but it was given that because there are some good elements of knowledge and understanding, they are just not developed. It does attempt to reach a little bit of an assessment, but it's very generic at the end. Both sides of the argument are given, which is why it pushes it into level two. Okay, it's not one-sided. There are points given for four and against, so it moves it out of level one and pushes it into level two. But this could have been a lot, lot better if the students had written in sentences, continuous prose and developed those points. Okay, so this is what we're, we're not what we're looking for nowadays. Back in the old style, many, many years ago, this would have got a lot more marks, but it was limited. So this was a level two and it was given five marks. E easy for the student to improve it. And again, it's a good example to show your students. They've got a balanced approach. They've made some valid points. They are just not developed and they've not evaluated and analyzed them fully. So I can see why some of you gave it level one, but because it's balanced, it does move it into level two. They're not the most developed points, but they are correct in their knowledge and understanding. So, that concludes the marking exercise. That was only an introduction. Like I said, use the resources, use these to show your students on how they can be improved. There's a lot more exemplar material on the website and also make use of the examiner's reports to further your understanding. Like I said, I get my students to do marking exercises, get them to swap papers and mark each other's particularly on the numerical side, so they can see that one mark doesn't mean they get everything wrong. Explain to them the power of own figure rule as well and allow them to develop that way. So that brings us to the end of the marking. 
just got to quick run through of the support that is available and the free support that is available from Pearson. So in your packs or on the website, you should have got the Getting Started Guide. Like I said, Pearson run lots of training events. The more you ask from your subject advisor, Colin Leaf, the more that you will get. OK, if a lot of you from your area or your country say that you want a meeting, they're more likely to send one of us out there to do a face to face training, which I know are a lot easier to do than these online ones. Like I said, you've got your subject advisor support. You've got the schemes of work. You've got the sample assessment materials and examiner's report. And like we've just looked at today, there are some exemplar mark responses on there. A lot of extra ones that you can go through. Have a look, see how these are marked. You've got all the past papers. You've got exam wizard, the mark schemes, the results plus and the access to scripts. So hopefully that is all easy for you to find. So on the right hand side, you've got the course materials, specifications and sample assessments. You've got exam materials and teaching and learning materials. They're really good to go through. And like I said, share with your students so they know what is expected of them. We then have the Results Plus, again, a free online results service that breaks down your student performance in the Pearson Edexcel exams. It can show you by topic or by question how your students have compared with other centres in your area. So it can help inform your teaching strategies and approaches. Like I said, I've used it a few times and I've noticed that my students don't perform very well on the statement of cash flows. And to some extent, they don't really do very well on the ratios either. So pop put in a lot more work on that and hopefully the grades will improve. You can also put in your mock exam results so it can analyse that for you. So if you look on the right hand side screen, it'll give you some form of data like that. If it's green, it means you're doing better than your peers or schools in your area. If it's the red bit, then you're underperforming on those types of questions compared with your other centres. We then have Exam Wizard. Hopefully you've all managed to log on to this and get used to it. It's again, it's a free tool that's got a bank of all the examined questions from the last 10, 15 years. And it allows you to put homework assignments and topic tests together. So if you wanted questions on trial balances, you can base it all on that. If you wanted it on control accounts, you can set the homework, set, set the uh, the bar to that as well. And then questions are tagged against either unit, topic or assessment objectives. So if you wanted to spend a bit of time on 12 mark essays, you could set it by the, the essays and you could have all the essays from the last, quite, last couple of sessions all put together in one. The mark schemes are also tagged so you don't have to go looking for them. And also the examiner's reports are also available. So it's very easy. You need to ask your exams officer to get you logged on to this, and then you can go through and find out or use this to plan out your homework, your assignments, and any topic tests that you want to do. The other one, as I mentioned before, is the access to scripts. Again, this is free and it is available on the day of exam results. This allows you to see and access electronically your students' exam papers. So it offers a transparent approach to marking, provides better understanding of the marking before requests for inquiries about results are made. So you can see your students' papers, you can see what they've written, you can compare it with the mark scheme, and you can get a full transparency when it comes to putting in an appeal. All right, I'm not saying you don't put in appeals if you think the marks are there, but it gives you a better insight. As we all know, mark uh, appeals can be expensive. Only appeal if you think the grade, the overall grade is going to go up, not just the score on that paper, because you only get a refund if the grade goes up. It's an excellent aid for teaching. But if you are going to use these in your classroom, you need permission from that student. 
Normally the students don't mind, but you have to get permission because it's data protection. So for example, if you've got a student who's got nearly four marks and you want to use that as an example to your students of what a, a, a very good exam paper looks like, you need permission for that student to be able to use it. You can cross their name off, but you still need permission to be able to show that with your students. And like I said, it's an excellent aid for, and for teaching and preparation and a good way of getting access to exam papers that have been marked. So again, it's free of charge. There is the paid resource, which is a textbook for Unit 1 and Unit 2. It's matched against the curriculum and that will help with planning, teaching and exam preparation. So that's a copy of the book. You've got student book one and student book two. Strong focus on progression, recognition and transferable skills allow us learning in a local context. I know school budgets are tight, but you might want to recommend it to your students to purchase themselves. And then we are moving on to the international on-screen assessment. With COVID happening and other things around the world, in 2020, Pearson started a pilot. And then for all GCSE international English exams, they are online. You do get the choice. You can sit it normally, but this seems to be the way forward. So the entries have doubled for on-screen exams as thousands of students around the world have chosen to take their international GCSEs on screen, not on paper. And Pearson are looking to move this forward with the A-levels. So as you can see from the table, 2024 is the launch of the business, GCSE Business, GCSE Economics, GCSE History and A-Level English Lit and English Lang. And then for next year, it's GCSE Geography, GCSE Pakistan Studies and GCSE Islamic Studies. So this is the way forward. Pearson are always looking for centres to be involved in pilots. So if it's something you might want to consider with your students, as I know these days, and you're probably well aware, students don't like writing anymore. They're a lot faster at typing and a lot quicker. But that is the way forward. So, any questions? I'll stay online for a few minutes if you've got any questions. Like I said, if you to help prepare with your mocks, mock exams, Exam Wizard is the place to go. Exam and Wizard is the place to go. Had a comment about the 12 marks. I always say for 12 marks, two for, two against, as long as they are well uh, explained and well developed. Uh, had a comment of what does no alien mean in the mark scheme. That means, for example, if you are doing a statement of comprehensive income and in the expenses account, someone wrote machinery, so under expenses, someone wrote machinery, that would be classed as an alien. Okay, it shouldn't be there. So that means you could, you will lose the own figure rule. So for example, They've wrote everything into their expenses because they have really no understanding. They've got motor vehicles in there. They've got trade receivables in there. That means where there's an own figure for the net profit, for example, they won't get the marks. Okay, so hopefully that answers your question on what no aliens mean. So it's something that's in the, shouldn't be there. Like I said, mixing up your assets and your expenses is a classic of an alien. I've seen many expenses or overheads that uh, expenses in the statement of comprehensive income that people have just thrown in machinery rather than depreciation. Okay, so thank you for attending today. I hope it's proved useful. There is that, yes, Exam Wizard also has the access for students, can, and that is the big problem. You've got the textbook where there will be some a few exam questions in there, but it is, it's the same with any subject. Unfortunately, nowadays, students can access everything online, and they're very good at finding mark schemes.
So like I said, thank you for attending. I hope the session is was good for you.